I still want to interview so many other independent bands like Six of Swords, Terrifier, Lindsay Schoolcraft. So I'm still waiting to email me back from. <laughs> oh, listen, I can't afford my assistant right now. Okay, I'm so <laughs> sorry, but yeah. It's okay. It's okay. oops. <laughs> it's all good. All... <laughs> Yo, I deserve that. I like. <laughs> I totally deserve that because I've been like, ooh, the wonderful world of songwriting. Avoid all responsibility. Like that's been the last three months, so it's okay. It's totally cool. <laughs> Just message me when you're ready to do it and we'll figure something out. Yeah, man. <laughs> I forget that, wait, is it recording? Take your time. I I don't really have control over when it starts recording Zoom. Oh wait, it is recording. It is recording. You got the little guy in the corner. You're good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm still used to Skype where it's in the corner. Oh, I know. Okay, it's still not recording yet. No. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Thrasher's Paradise. And we are joined with actually someone that has a record that I'm surprised they, they, they own you are now the most appeared guest on thrasher's paradise with four that's pretty cool that's pretty cool for the longest time it was Corey uh from johnny no cash and crimson shadows i love Corey, one of my favorite people <laughs> a drummer named greg from a band called apoc becomes astro stolos mm -hmm. and then another member of crimson shadows a newer member alex uh, he is also right. of Unbowed and becomes Astros based in Guelph. Okay. But no, you you take the cake with four. All right. That's what I'd rather have that record than, you know, like a horrible record of something else. So cool. <laughs> no, so, well, it, it's, I find it funny that we've had you on interrupting two previous interviews, the Zoom call. Oh, yeah. Now, this interview where I made the smart ass joke. <laughs> oh, it was great. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you for doing this because I know you are an extremely busy woman recording guest vocal work, the Harp album, and the next album to Martyr, which you can find on Spotify, Bandcamp, and other Jeez. sources. Well, <laughs> so the first oh, question, I, thank you. The first question I have is something I've been really curious about. Now it's no secret you were part of Cradle of Filth for almost the better part of the 2010s. My mm -hmm. question is. What is the most Canadian thing you ever did in front of the Cradle of Filth Boys? I put maple syrup in my coffee once and they were just disgusted with me. <laughs> so that, I'll never forget that, you know, and then of course, like I say, like they say about, and I'm like, you know, about, you know, like apparently it's really bad, but I, and when I say about, I don't hear it, but they think oh. I'm saying about. Oh, uh, so yeah, they'd make fun of that. Uh, they say I really talk from my n nasal soft palate, which I think is just influence of French Canada, which like, you know, isn't a bad thing. They're mm -hmm. like, you're extremely nasally. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's also good singing. <laughs> Knowing sure where your soft palate is, you know, so yeah, that was probably the, the extent of the Canadianism that happened in that band. <laughs> All right. Now, a couple of months ago, you did an interview with actually a good friend of mine, uh, or a good friend of ours, a mutual friend, Tom McKay of Metal Robot Reviews. And in the interview, it was a phone call interview, and he did the Beelzebub character of you Photoshop. Right. Have you seen the video, and what do you think of his work of the, the character? I, I say, like, you know, we, we, we can't all be good at everything, you know, and I think in the case of Tom, He's very good at the one thing he does. He's very good at interviewing and uh, he's a great guy, but obviously like, you know, like his paint shop skills were not I incredible, but I mean, he did a better job than I ever could because I would just do stick people, which I kind of got like called out for when I sent the vision board for my music video. Uh, you know, one person was like, my eight-year-old son could have done a better um, not vision board, but like a pre-production storyboard for the music mm -hmm. video. He's like, my eight-year-old could have done this better. I'm like, well, like, listen, I only do music. Like, what do you want from me? <laughs> Damn. So, yeah, no, I think, I think Tom did just fine. Oh, no, I, everyone, everyone in my circle, you know, so to say, bust my ovaries about things. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> like, I'm not pretending to be good at everything. That's, that's the millennial lie. 
<laughs> now, last week, I believe, you did an Instagram live stream just letting everyone know you were okay and all that stuff. I just want to say as a fan and as a friend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. We're, we're bros. It's cool. Okay, we're bros. I'm <laughs> yeah. happy to hear that you are doing okay mentally and all that. But the interesting thing I saw that you did bring up was your hair was wavy and it was all done up. Was it weird for you to have it done that way? Yeah, my, um, so I have a friend who does my hair. She's just about to graduate hair school, but she actually wants to come work from my record label, which I totally need someone like that in my record label. Like she's got all the stuff. Her name's Kristen. She's good people. So she surprised me. She's like, oh, I don't have the, it's like her dogs are kid. I don't have the dog tonight blah 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 I'm gonna come down and hang out we're gonna have a sleepover I'm like oh this is so like 90s okay let's do it <laughs> so she like braided my hair right and, and mm -hmm. I had to sleep on it It was extremely uncomfortable and then yeah the next day I was like I don't know how I feel about this but like it, I kind of have to get used to it because if you're gonna have someone on your team who's consistently doing your hair all cray cray like it just mm -hmm. you gotta get used to it but yeah it was just random um but it was nice for a change because usually like this is the special uh, you know post shower special over here it's, it's nothing great <laughs> it's i'm going off of i'm going off of that you meant you just brought up that starting up a record label you now i'm assuming you're signed to your own like record label yeah we're like independent we're not listed but okay. it's like a, it is technically a record label and how we function how now for you what has been the most difficult part about starting up your record label uh in the beginning, I wasn't aware of all the rules and, and regulations like to start up your own small business in Canada. And uh, I don't care what they say. It's, it's challenging and there's not a ton of support. Uh, Service Canada was great with obtaining my license to like actually, you know, get paid and pay my taxes. But there was a lot that I just was not ready for. And the first launch was like pretty messy behind the scenes, but we, we patched it up and we we worked hard and attacked it and made sure that there was no issues. And now like, you know, taxes are paid, government's cool. Um, I think, you know, uh, I didn't really realize I was starting a record label until I went to Germany last summer. And during a two week break between shows, I met up with, uh, so uh, his name, he goes by Zen. He's the singer of Nabla and Scaris, but he also has a, a black metal band with me called Antiqua. And we also met with the guitarist Fabian. So I said, guys, I have something to tell you. It's not bad. It's just different. They're like, what the heck? So we all go out for coffee in, in Hamburg. And then I'm like, okay, so I've looked at everything that's about to happen and I'm starting my own record label. And they were like, okay, <laughs> do you need help? <laughs> you know, but it, it was just, it, it, the challenge was actually just claiming it. It's like, you can say you're independent or, you know, like we have an office here with a board of like, we're in touch with different publishing and royalty distribution. Um, we do all our own marketing and advertising and um, yeah, we're, we're like, you know, very, um, I guess like a, a symbiotic breathing system that is always uh, self-sufficient. And we're just like, really like, we're not about like, becoming multimillionaires, which would be mm -hmm. lovely because then I can afford the full orchestra for both DVD recordings. But I'm more, I'm more about sustainability. I just want my, my projects to be sustainable and I want people to at least go home at the end of the day, like getting a slight paycheck versus like the way labels are doing it and they oversign and they can't focus on their artists. And then, oh, so now that you've recouped, here's your check for 18 cents. And I'm like, um, I, I don't know if you've heard that story. I don't remember which band it was. But I just don't want to uh, do that for the, to the 10 musicians I'm responsible for in my solo band in an Antiqua. Mm -hmm. uh, but having, having someone else come on is going to ease the, uh, I hate doing office work. Like I hate, you know, counting my receipts. Is this a oh, business write-off? Yep. Like filing away from my, I have an accountant and I have an on-call lawyer, both wonderful people. But yeah, it just it turned into this huge thing. And I'm just like, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to make music brand myself, make really awesome products my fans love, create experiences. And then I got this awesome person in the background who's already an entrepreneur in their own mind who's done this before, who can be just like, yeah, I got that. I got the email. I got your to-do list. Like, I'm just, I feel so good to like have someone backing me. And, and the, the things they want to do, and they also get to play with my hair. They love my hair because, you know, Romanian genetics, I've got a ton of it. And I didn't know that most people's hair wasn't this thick. Oh, <laughs> so you're quite Romanian? And I'm mainly half Romanian and half Irish, yeah. 
Ah, uh, that it's explains the, the... this weird facial structure going on. <laughs> I was going to say that explains the Queen of Darkness persona. Yeah, uh, it well that's that Danny loved that um when I was in Cradle Filth, he loved that it was half remaining and he's like, You're a vampire. <laughs> he's like, You're a potato eating vampire. I'm like, Yes, I am. <laughs> I love my potatoes. <laughs> I can take it. Listen, I've been called everything under the sun being half Irish. I'm I'm over it. My freckles can handle it. Okay. Now I now I know my buddy I know Tom recently interviewed too. Mm -hmm. So I hope he didn't ask you this. Okay. I'm not too sure. I'll take a chance with it though. If he did, you don't have to answer it again. No, uh, I don't care. Now, do you get confused for for being emo instead of goth? Uh when the boom of emo, so to say, I think that was what like near the end of the two thousands going into twenty ten. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's when emo really started. So like for me, when I saw the Uprising Emo, even locally in my scene here in Oshawa, that's when The Open Door came out for Evanescence, which is my favorite album. And of course, I had that attire. And at the time, because uh, I'm, if you can't tell by my aesthetic and where I live, I'm a very colorful queen of darkness. I love my colors. Um, I'm okay with that. And, and because I was such a colorful, uh, I guess, baby bat at the time as a goth kid, so to say, I was in my very early 20s, um, I did get confused as an emo kid quite a bit. And I was like, oh, I don't identify with emo at all. I didn't have the shaggy feathered hair or anything. And the only, I guess, so to say, even close to emo band I listened to was My Chemical Romance, but I didn't even know they were emo because like, I came from a punk band in my teens. So I was like, well, to me, like, My Chemical Romance was just extremely mainstream, catchy, melodic punk with a slight dark edge to it. Like, I had no mm -hmm. idea what emo was. So, like, you know, and at the time, we all joke, like, uh, you know, even though I wasn't in my punk band anymore, I was still friends with them, and they always used to call me the emo kid. And I'm like, I don't understand this. But at the same time, I do, because I just actually purged my closet. And I mm -hmm. have a lot of my clothing from back then. And I'm like, okay, this was really Tim Burton. Like, I can kind of see... Like, I looked quite a bit like a character from Nightmare Before Christmas. So I was like, okay, I can see kind of like why I was getting the whole emo label. Because for some reason, all of a sudden, Nightmare Before Christmas, like, and Tim Burton aesthetic went from being a baby bat thing, like a, a mall goth, I guess, so mm -hmm. to say thing, to all of a sudden, like, just being totally claimed by the emo culture. And I'm like, when did this happen? So I was just like, I don't know. But I just kind of like... <laughs> miss that and I, I feel like I'm very inspired by that 90s club goth like that's more of my aesthetic and of course like going back into trad goth and all that stuff like I, I kind of that post-punk thing I, I've done my research I know the history but uh you know some goths will say oh emo is not part of goth at all but I kind of say well it is because trad goth came from post-punk and emo came from that darker punk edgy weird punk so to say so like i embrace mm -hmm. it i say if you're dark and spooky i'm all about you so like i don't i don't try to like exclude anyone so to say okay <laughs> yeah sorry long-winded i've had a lot of coffee long-winded uh, oh no no there. i wasn't expecting like because i grew up with the i guess the emo scene yeah i wasn't really too sure about really the behind the scenes work of it that yeah. really yeah I think I said it right right yeah, yeah no that makes sense yeah I'm one of those people who like I don't know if it's my upbringing but I just never like feeling stupid so I do like a lot of research on a lot of things but I also understand I can't know everything so if I don't know something I'm like well please educate me or you know I will go to my little super computer in my pocket and pull it the google machine you know mm -hmm. so yeah sorry I Oh, that's okay. forever. Yeah, I'm just like, okay, so history said. <laughs> Welcome to school. Welcome to Schoolcraft with Lindsay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've been schoolcrafted. <laughs> I'm actually curious. What inspired the Schoolcraft name? So, um, in my early 20s, I, oh gosh, my poor, poor young me, I went through 14 years of Roman Catholic school uh i'm still like trying to get over my 
trauma of white men telling me what I should be doing with my life. I'm still working on that. <laughs> um, you know, apparently I was supposed to just be a baby machine and give up on my hopes and dreams. Um, mm. Good old Catholicism. So uh, coming out of high school, it's kind of like this, this foundation just cracks beneath you and, you know, you start to realize what the world is really like. And at the time I wasn't doing too well. And we were having a conversation over dinner one night with my family and found out that there was Native Americans in my family and sorry, First Nations, um, to be politically correct, First Nations in our family. So at, at the time we thought we would, they were directly in our bloodline. And uh, I was like, wow, was like, this is really interesting, you know, being me, I'm going to go research it. And through that, I actually found a lot of what I believed as a very little child was very much rooted, in, uh, rooted in their spirituality. So the native, the, sorry, the first nations in my family, their last name was Schoolcraft. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to adopt Schoolcraft because like, even though okay. my legal last name is rooted in my Scottish Irish, um, you know, family, I really felt no connection to it. You know what I mean? Like, especially mm -hmm. because when you go back to Scotland and Ireland, it's, it's, still Christian or Catholic and it's very routed in that and I didn't want to really identify with that anymore it's still like you have to use your legal name as a songwriter when you're listed that's fine um but as an artist as someone you know I I adopted the spirituality which I still practice um to to this day and I still look up on the readings and everything and I have a native elder I can call anytime if you know a woodpecker just all of a sudden leaves me a pile of feathers you know <laughs> just random stuff um but it's very it's very important to me so yeah i just adopted the name uh it just sounded better it felt better i don't know it was i thought it was more memorable and um more, more kind of close to my heart than my actual birth name okay now i've seen you talk about your first your audition tape for cradle and i've oh, seen gosh. you talk about martyr but this next question is for the middle EP, Dead of Winter, which I haven't seen many people talk about with you. Right. And I'm very curious about the second track, which is a cover of Madonna's Frozen. Yes. What made you want to cover that particular song by Madonna? It was like, I was in, when did that come out? Late 90s. And it was like my introduction to that dark mysterious woman so to say that gothic aesthetic and that song mm -hmm. was like my favorite like when it came out for years I just absolutely adored that song and I loved everything about it and even going back now and listening to it and understanding production and all the instruments that they put into it I was like wow this the song is amazing so I was humming and hawing and um before Rocky Gray showed up into the pictures part of my studio team and songwriting team and all that um, it was mainly me, my producer, Tyler Williams at Monolithic Productions, and Spencer Cregan, who is um, an orchestral composer. He's fantastic to work with. So Spencer kind of lost his shit when I said I was like humming and hawing. He's like, oh, I can do a sketch of that, like, like that. I love that song too. And I'm like, oh, Spencer, like, we all, like, we, me and Spencer, we get excited about a lot of the same music. So it, it was him who kind of forced it into, you know, the studio, and then, you know, me and Tyler, just, just two of us, try to wrap our head around, like, how the heck do we do this, you know? So, yeah, um, that was really fun. Uh, I think Tyler said it was his first song with over, like, 300 tracks that he had to mix. He was like, oh, God, help. It was uh, live <laughs> drums. Scott, mm -hmm. uh, my roommate and my drummer, um, he, he did live drums. That was the first time I ever first and last time I ever did live drums on anything, um, which I appreciate because it sounds, you know, it sounds so good. Um, but, uh, sorry, my computer's just yelling at me here. Uh, anyways, hopefully it doesn't restart. It's like, you need to restart. I'm like, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, that, that was just like a collection of songs that had a very wintry theme about them. Mm -hmm. And it was just something to do Cradle, working for Cradle was so sporadic and you never knew one day to the next and you could think you had like three to five months off and then that would change like that. And I was just really trying not to forget about my dream mm -hmm. while helping sustain someone else's, which was exhausting. Um, and uh, I was really fighting for that little EP to happen at the time because 
I think at that point I was an official member and I was working on like Hammer of the Witches and it was like extremely demanding and frustrating with being from different countries or trying to make it work. So that was just me remembering to hold on to what I wanted to do because if I didn't take the time to do something for myself, I was just going to lose myself in cradle filth and, and, and you have to remember your own creativity and your own ideas and your own vision and not get stuck up in someone else's um, you know, because it's, it's this big job that you have that is this wonderful thing that you want to hold on to. So that was essentially why that EP came about. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so it's no secret that off of your latest release, Martyr, track 11 yeah. is the cover of The Cure's Lullaby. Now, this question isn't about the song. It's, I think, okay. a bit of a fun question for you to really think about. Now, okay. out of the 10 tracks that are your creation, if there was to ever come a time of a certain artist to cover it, what song would you like to see of yours covered and by who? Oh my gosh, like The Weeknd or Jonathan Davis of Korn. I think that would be so cool. <laughs> I know, I went from like one extreme to one like extreme within my genre, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think that would be ace. I think that'd be really neat. Let's have Bjork take one of my ballads and work her magic all over it. That'd be pretty magical. <laughs> awesome. Now, recently in your hometown of Oshawa, a certain music venue shut down. I forget the yeah. name of it. Um, the music Hall. Yes, the Oshawa Music Hall. Uh, just what are your thoughts about the closure of that? Uh, it, w honestly, it wasn't surprising um, because... God, I can't imagine what the upkeep and the rent on that place was like. And I'm really sad. I know the owners and they, they have my love and support. Uh, and I've been, ever since this happened, I've been extremely worried about, you know, touring crew, promoters, uh, live music venues. It's been extremely difficult. And uh, yeah, I'm just heartbroken, uh, really, you know, and they, they did so much to like keep that venue going and and then this happens and this, this pandemic has really, well, it's kind of thrown everyone's lives upside down, so to say. And I try to support people where I can, but I think that with the music hall, I don't think there was any way of, you know what I mean? Any way of making <laughs> that happen, especially with so much uncertainty and the rules yeah. and now we're worried about a second wave and it, it's just, it's, it sucks, but it mm -hmm. is what it is. I'm sure the owners are going to go on and do something great because they're great people. Excellent. Now, it's no secret that you are a Juno-nominated musician now. And they're currently on hold. There will be a ceremony at some point. Now, sure. yeah. I just want to get your opinion about my opinion, if you may. Just as a little... Sure. Okay, so it's no secret that gothic metal, doom metal anything on that, and even symphonic metal, are not really that popular, to say, in the, can in the market of Canada. There aren't no. a lot of them in the independence and stuff like that. Like here in Ontario, we have newly shadow called Cecile Monique and yourself right now. Uh, if I feel, if you were, and when you do, <laughs> win the Juno, I oh, feel... <laughs> well, I feel there's going to be that kind of Toronto Raptor effect where they won the title and there was just a boom of people wanting to play basketball. Kind of, I feel if you were to win, oh, interesting. there would be a, I feel there would be a bit more of a surgence of Gothic doom symphonic metal in the Canadian market. That'd be cool. That'd be really nice. How do you feel about kind of what I'm saying? You know, I'm just one of those people who just really lives my life and I just, I really try to make the best of the day and make sure like I have, I can get through the next month and I can get through the year. And I don't really think about the influence I have. I do. I take it seriously. The influence I have on people is something I take very seriously because I just want, I want at the end of the day, everyone to be happy and accepted and heard and seen and go on and live their dreams essentially so I mean I think that would be absolutely crazy um, if all of a sudden like 
a resurgence of like gothic pop rock with all these like the undertones of the subgenres you mentioned like all of a sudden just became a thing in Canada I think that would be lovely um you know and I can understand why symphonic metal had its heydays between 2005 I guess trickling off at like about, about a decade and, and kind of halting about 2015 and then the oversaturation of the orchestra and heavy metal got really cheesy and just kind of recited back to Europe and was still being expressed and appreciated at European festivals. Um, but I think we can, we can bring that back in a different way. Like it doesn't have to go away entirely. And it, it's really the music that I wanted to make with my team. Um, so, I mean, it would, it would be cool, but I just, what I want people to do is to find their own voice in their creativity. If, if, if anything I'm doing is inspiring you, find, find yourself in that. Like, um, I wasted so many years of my life for too long trying to be like someone else. And now I think it's the effect of the thirties. Now you're going to hear a very different voice and slightly different style on my my next little release the harp album because you need to really just express music as who you are so if anyone's like gonna see what i'm doing and they're like oh now i want to do that it, you know if if the win i mean i'm just honored as is to be nominated and if anyone in that category won i would be so happy for them because most of them are my friends and i just want to see everyone succeed and do well i feel like i'm doing that already in my own right um so uh yeah, if they if they find me or they ever find this interview and they're like, oh, I want to do what she's doing, like, do it in your own way. Like, I, something that not a lot of people know that actually, like, I failed miserably on, um, and uh, maybe it'll happen down the road, is in the beginning when I started my solo project, in place of guitars, I actually wanted cellos. Like, I wanted to do a very apocalyptica type thing, but... Mm -hmm finding a cellist who understood that and could do that in this area was extremely difficult. And in the end, I got a good friend of mine to be like an accent in the background, which was lovely. But, you know, now that's kind of something that's shifted over to my black metal band and it really belongs there and it's really working. So, you know, if that's something you want to do, you want to make a prominent instrument. I mean, it, honestly, if, if there was more of a surgence of harpists and we could save the damn instrument, I would be more happy for that because Looking into the history, I think there's two times in history where harps nearly went extinct and they like burned all of them. And, you know, now it's evolving into this electronic, electroacoustic instrument and so much can be done with it with guitar pedals, which is kind of where I'm going in this next release because I just want to because I can. I have this, I, because I can complex like a Freddie Mercury thing or something. Mm -hmm. I want it all and I want it now. So <laughs> if there was all of a sudden this, you know, instead of my generation, being totally in, like like I know like anyone around my age who's in a rock and metal Evanescence heavily influenced them and they all want to play the, the piano and that's fine the piano is a wonderful instrument it's the compass of music it, it helps you with everything it's such a visual um, guide for singers and writing and theory it's one of the best instruments to learn but if all of a sudden now all these teenage girls want to take up the harp I think that's amazing plus the more we have available the more affordable they're going to be and i'm not complaining about that because like i want to buy more harps you know i'm going to be that lady with like 10 cats and 20 harps in my house <laughs> in 10 years and i'm okay with that but yeah like i mean if that's like i think that that would be really cool but again like i, uh, I if i just like i think if anything like if i ever want to leave an, a legacy or if i ever want to influence people i just want them to find themselves be inspired by anything i'm doing and you know um kind of show people that you can do it yourself you don't have to rely on other people to do it for you i think that's like a huge mistake that a lot of artists make and get trapped into these labels and stuff um and managers and whoever else is um hindering them more than helping them bloom mm -hmm. so that's kind of the legacy i want to leave i mean again if if there's more symphonic metal in canada i would not be upset i would be like this is awesome <laughs> it'd be so great <laughs> i'd love awesome. to see 
more classical players coming out of university into metal and playing metal than there is right now, definitely. Like, it'd be cool if you go, you go to local shows and there's like a whole orchestra there, but you don't even know it because there's like 50 people and they play like, we have a whole orchestra in the room, but y'all are here just to watch the metal show. Maybe that's how I'll find my orchestra. I don't know. But anyways. <laughs> <realize. laughs> awesome. awesome. Now, you did bring up the harp album. For you personally, what was the hardest... I guess, part about writing the harp album. I have this issue as a songwriter where I write far beyond my playing ability. Like I have these ideas, but I can't play that fast or I can't play this technique or I don't know how to play the viola. So, you know, it's like weird things that happen or I'll hear a beat and I'm just, as thank God I date a drummer. Um, you know, like I have this beat and they help me tap it out, which I, I appreciate him for so much. Um, but uh, I think the hardest part was I got halfway through and I had this issue with piano. I fatigued on piano because you learn about like, you, you know, I'm like, okay, I got like five to 10 different techniques, patterns that I'm cool with and I can write with for now. But then you start realizing oh, I don't want this all to sound same, same. I want mm -hmm. every harp song to have its own thing. So I had to go to lessons and that was challenging because I'm halfway through the writing of 11 songs, um, some already done, some brand new. I think the newer ones were more challenging um, because there was no template to go by everything else that happened so quickly. And then, you know, I'm stuck on these two originals for like the last month and I'm like ripping my hair out over one of them being brand new and one mm -hmm. of them being very old and having to recreate a very old song which was like lovely but also irritating beyond you know like cleaning the dust off that one was was just atrocious uh but we got through it so mm -hmm. uh yeah that i think that was the most challenging part was like it, it was fun but i i just sit down for two to four hours every day and do my lesson work and then write and then practice and then focus on groups of two to three songs at a time which essentially like led me to getting it completed but, but yeah it was it was a it was a lot of work and now we haven't even gotten to the stage yet like we've done we've tracked many layers and like making that ambient sound like we haven't even mm -hmm. gotten there yet we're actually once i'm done here chatting with you today that's where i'm gonna end up i'm gonna go over the monolithic productions and we're gonna start combing through uh all the strings are done so i just want to hear the strings right now that's all i give a crap about <laughs> awesome <laughs> yeah now, to bring up the tom mckay interview once again you did mention that after the harp album, the next, I guess the next album after yeah. Murder, it's going to be a bit heavier. And what yes. you, in what sense do you mean it's going to be a bit heavier? Are you going to growl? Oh, I can, but I'm not like, I think I sound terrible. Uh, my guttural vocals are just like gurgling. It just, it's, it's the cookie monster, you know, <laughs> half awake. It's terrible. Uh, I'm not a very good growler. I don't think mm -hmm. I am. Maybe I am. Um, but I don't know. And I like singing clean. That's my thing. So uh, when I say heavier, and I've talked about this with Rocky, and me and Rocky have a plan for the next album, because we just, we really had no plan. This album came out of nowhere over the span of a year. It was supposed to start as a cover, and then a single, and then an EP, and then all of a sudden it was 17 songs. And we're like, okay, well, Clearly this is working, but we, oh, I love that your cat came to say hello. Uh, yeah. Mine's passed out on the bed right now, blended in with my black laundry. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, when we looked at the album, especially when we tried to bring Martyr live with my band, we're like, there's only like two and a half heavy songs and the rest of this is pretty chill. And I'm like, I know that's where I messed up. <laughs> so we're actually thinking about with every rock song, sitting down like we have plans to meet up once this pandemic does whatever it's going to do and we can actually travel again uh rocky would love to come here um which tyler's totally stoked about i think everyone's stoked about it secretly i'm like mm -hmm. the only one not freaking out yet um and uh so th that's the thing like that album fallen by evanescence just changed my life forever and now the person who was a huge foundation in that sound is on my team and i've written an album with so that's cool. And uh, we're, we're actually going to like sit with the guitar and like jam and write the songs and like lead each other. And, and, and as we go, we're going to make sure that these things are like 
written for the live stage to really pu mm -hmm. put forward a pulse and an energy of a heavier a heavier setup and uh, i really like that because like my favorite songs on martyr are definitely like savior and see the light and the end of lullaby because it's so darn heavy and that's what i like you know i love that stuff obviously um mm -hmm. so yeah like we we really need to problem solve because we didn't really think about the live show when we were writing this album we were just having fun and then when it was all like wrapped up i'm like this is more like a hymn album like it's very chill gothic rock metal and i'm like kind of want to really make some heavy stuff <laughs> like it's not awesome. feeding my appetite mm -hmm. for heavier music so to say like the the love i have of alternative and new metal that came out in the early 2000s yeah no well I'm looking forward to hearing the next, I guess, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing both The Heart and the next album after that, which Cheers. that might be titled. You're welcome. Now, looking at my clock, and we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to ask you, I guess, two fun, in, two fun questions. Okay. Now, Cecile Monique was asked this, and I actually have to go on my phone to get this because my memory is not that great. <laughs> when it, comes oh, to it gets worse as you get older, I promise. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you need to-do lists and reminders. It's brutal. Okay. Which horror or fantasy character would you date? Oh, my God. Okay, but he's gay, so like I can't <laughs> date him. <laughs> it's uh, it's Renan from the Dragon Prince. He's like the most beautiful male elf I've ever seen, next to Legolas, of course. But like Orlando Bloom, and I like outside of the like last role, I'm not really attracted to him, and I'm still offended that his eyebrows didn't match his blonde hair. So as an elf, he's just failed me miserably. But yeah, probably Renan from like the Dragon Prince, but he's gay. So like, I need to respect he has a husband. You know what I mean? So like, I mean, if he has like, if he has like a twin brother who's straight, I like, call me. But again, <laughs> or maybe Loki, but he just seems like a flat. Loki. I don't know if I can deal with Loki, like the Tom Hilson version. I just mm -hmm. be like, you're such a spoiled brat like you need a hug i am not dating you until you figure your crap out call me then you know like i just i don't know seems like such a turd nugget but he's beautiful <laughs> that is awesome that went way better than what i was expecting because <laughs> <laughs> i she posted this on instagram because she said Vic oh. the corpse bride oh yeah oh he's so lovely actually the person i'm dating now is a lot like victor oh really like so yeah, my boyfriend is, like, tall, skinny, uh, talented, like, totally, like, bashful and clumsy, and, yeah, so. <laughs> and <laughs> sounds okay like Johnny that. Depp? No, he's, <laughs> he talks off his soft palate like me. You should hear him talk about Yu-Gi-Oh cards. It's the, the cutest and the nerdiest thing I've ever experienced in my life. It's so cute. But then I start talking about Gen 1 Pokemon, and it's, it's over, so. <laughs> 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 really? It's over? No, meaning like my nerdiness just like Oh, okay. Out taps his nerdiness, you know what I'm saying? Ah, oh, gotcha, gotcha. No, and then mm -hmm. the last question we asked, well, I can't refer to you as a first time guest because this is your fourth time. Your first <laughs> the first time we interview a person on the show, we always ask this this question last to ensure that we are talking to actual people that understand metal music or rock oh, music. Oh gosh! Oh gosh! We call it the poser. I'm such an imposter. <laughs> oh yeah. no! I hope I I'm hope a classical not. musician who fell into heavy metal. Like, what do you want from me? <laughs> With all the musicians you meet, you've you've met, I hope you know this answer. Who would win? Okay, a, maybe. Maybe who would win in a fight? Sick, go ahead. Or God. Say it again, you totally broke up. Who? Ah, uh, who would win in a fight? Lemmy or God? I think God would just, like, move aside. I think he'd just step aside. He'd just be like, you're Lemmy. Like, <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to fight you. I don't, I don't want to lose limbs or my ability <laughs> to, like, create. Like, just, I'll step aside. 
you can come flirt with all the people in heaven, all the beautiful women in heaven. It's your, like, your Lemmy. Here's your stage. Entertain these people up here. The end. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's such a good answer. That's, a, that's definitely a first time that's a I've good gotten question. for that answer. Hmm? Mm. It's a good question. Thank you. No, oh, I was scared that you weren't going to know it. By the way, you were. Well, like, oh no, I know, I know. Some, oh no, you know, like I've been doing this for a really long time. I mm -hmm. I dated a metalhead before I joined Cradle, so I think it's been about. I was listening to metal before that. I think it's been over a decade. It's been like thirteen years of metal for me, not just like okay. mainstream alternative and and you know even in high school the new mm -hmm. metal i listened to it's been a long time i, I know my metal <laughs> Have, you know you, whether i wanted to or not do you know the movie from where that question comes from no what is it it's called airheads oh i've never seen that one i've seen uh oh. foobar i've seen spinal tap uh i can't remember what else i've seen <laughs> I've seen quite a few. <laughs> okay, well, if you ever get the chance, Airheads, it has Brandon Fraser, Adam Sandler, and Steve Buscemi. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And it's the greatest band name ever. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> well, That's Lindsay, too good. Well, Lindsay, our time is up. Thank you so much for doing this interview. I greatly appreciate this. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the people who are going to be watching this on YouTube? Oh, gosh. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. You got a laugh. Uh, yeah, thanks for showing up. That's, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I kind of wish it was an ending. We're having so much fun. Aww, I know, but I, I'm having fun, too. Don't get me wrong, but I know you'll be back for the Zoom call July 4th because we're Canadian, okay. and that means nothing for us. <laughs> exactly. And they have their own issues with that day now, so they can just... <laughs> Yeah. Figure it out. We'll be on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, Lindsay, again, thank you so much for this. I'm like, let's just not talk about America right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm not. No, no, not me. Not me. No. <laughs> yeah, we're good. We're good. Bless. Good. I just wish them the best. Oh, same. Well, anyways. <laughs> I'm going to stop recording now. Everyone, keep on thrashing. And.